Apologies for the delay. Like with every good high-tech conference on technology, I'm afraid we have a technological hitch, and so we're waiting for the videos to get fixed. Uh, so just one more minute of your patience. Forgive us before we get started. Right, with or without the technology, we are going ahead. Are you okay? A very, very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, this morning, this very English morning in Paris, um, my name is Sasha Havlicek and I run the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London. Um, and I am delighted to be presiding over this wonderful panel of international speakers. I very much hope we can make this uh, despite the format of the room, a very interactive and informal conversation. Uh, and just to start with, I'd be very grateful if we could have a show of hands. Uh, how many of you in this room are representing the NGO sector, the non-governmental sector? Fantastic. Anybody from government? Yes. Thank you so much. And anybody from the private sector? Fantastic. So we've got quite a mix. Uh, to, just to put this into context a little bit, I think it's extremely poignant that this event is taking place against the backdrop of uh, Armistice Centennial celebrations and, of course, um, the Paris Peace Forum, which is taking uh, up so much international attention, quite rightly. And, and the grand theme of this year's Peace Forum is global governance. And as we see a number of international leaders fight to try to keep alive uh, the institutional underpinning of our uh, world order. It seems uh, here at this event uh, that we are just on the outset of a journey, a journey uh, for the governance of a new frontier, of our new Wild West, and that is the internet. Uh, and so as we start this uh, conversation, just to tell you that we at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue have been working since 2006 and our inception on addressing this uh, global set of challenges posed to us by uh, extremist groups, by terrorist groups, uh, by hate mongers uh, around the world. And as we uh, watched those networks and those organizations mobilize, uh, and then watched them migrate very effectively and adeptly into the online space, so we too started to do our own listening exercises, understanding how they were mobilizing, understanding that they were effectively very strong early adopters of new communications technologies. And they were organizing themselves, not just nationally, but transnationally in effective ways, ways that uh, the new global infrastructure for communication um, was particularly well suited to. And the impact of that mobilization is, of course, uh, very clear to all of us. Uh, the impact uh, we often look at in terms of the rise in terrorism. Now, of course, just recently, uh, this attempt uh, on Macron's uh, life seems to have been thwarted. We are reminded of the full spectrum ideologically of those challenges, from Islamist through to far right. But we're also reminded of the challenges of hate mongering uh, because of the enormous rise in hate crime statistics across every market that we know of in the world. And so we saw just in the United Kingdom in 2017 a rise in hate crime of 29%. This last year now um, a rise in 19%. 
So year on, uh, year out, we see uh, these problems um, on the march. Uh, but I think that the impact is something uh, more dire even than that. And while the manifestations of violence are a clear uh, problem, it is the mainstreaming of hateful uh, ideologies and ideas that I find uh, most worrying. And we see uh, that happening in a number of different ways. The Global uh, Peace Index has an indicator which talks about the acceptance of the rights of others. And that indicator has plummeted across every Western market over the recent period. It is an indicator of attitudinal change. It is an indicator of how far those extreme ideas have entered into the mainstream, the mainstream of politics, the mainstream of civil action. And these are the challenges, I believe, that no one sector, no government alone, no private uh, company alone uh, can manage. It requires an absolutely holistic uh, approach. And so I'm delighted that we have in the room with us um, a very, very strong cross-section uh, of the actors needed in order to solve these problems. At the Institute, we've said for a long time that um, there have to be three, at least three prongs to any strategy to address these challenges in the online world. Um, of course, regulation, uh, moderation of content, regulation uh, is the absolute focus for many governments and has been to date. So a first prong on regulation. I think it's important to note uh, that that content focus, the focus on the removal of content that has been at the heart of government initiatives in the uh, counter-terrorism space, uh, as well as to some extent uh, more recently in the hate speech space, is interesting and important. But it raises a whole range of very important uh, challenges and questions. Um, that we believe need to be taken on board, not least the fact that content removal and the governance of content removal can never quite be uh, the full answer to the story. As I think everybody in this uh, room would know, the large focus, of course, has been on the four big companies, maybe three, four major companies. It hasn't taken into account the, the wider ecosystem challenges that we face in terms of hate speech. And as we've seen, uh, moderation and controls uh, more and more imposed on some of the big platforms. We have seen, again, an out-migration of these problems onto smaller platforms, an entire uh, ecosystem of companies that are now being um, monopolized by some of these hate groups, but also an entire section, a sector being developed in order to respond uh, to those limitations, what we call the alt-tech space. So technology set up in, in order to obviate. And of course, there is the evolving uh, landscape of these extremist groups. It's difficult to keep up to date with all of that. And here comes the need for expertise uh, and for the civic sector and for information that again, we require a multi-sectoral response for. But again, the gray area of content uh, and that problem represents us with, I think, two other important uh, approaches. And those are the two that we're going to be focusing on here today. And that is essentially how we compete. How does civil society mobilize to compete? How do we create a better level playing field for civil society to compete with these bad actors in the online space? And so we will look in the first place at the sorts of collaborations that are needed in order to make that competition effective. And then we will look, of course, at education and that wider, longer term uh, challenge of inoculation. How do we get young people understanding what it is that they're operating within in order to be able to genuinely be resilient to these challenges? So we have two parts of today's conversation. The first on this notion of civic collaboration with other sectors for effect. And the structure of the conversation will be the following. We will hear from two projects um, who will tell us a little bit about their experiences of work in that space. And then we'll have a panel, a wonderful, very illustrious panel, uh, speak to those projects and to the approaches presented by those projects. And I hope we can open up the conversation uh, to the floor. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce 
uh, a wonderful person, a, a very, very close friend of our organization, Guillaume Buffet, founder of the Seriously Project and vice president of Renaissance Numérique, a fantastic uh, organization in France. When we found them, we felt that we'd found our sort of uh, professional twin in France, um, doing extremely important work. So over to you, Guillaume. We look forward to hearing about your work. Thank you, Sasha, and good morning, everybody. As you may hear, now there is a French people on stage. Uh, I can't hide my fantastic French accent, sorry. Uh, just before I start, I wanted to thank uh, Jennifer here and Mike, which are the two people from Renaissance Numérique who have organized all this panel. From, it took four or five months to organize that, and uh, congrats for your fantastic job. Um, okay, so I'm here to talk about uh, seriously. Um, I was yesterday uh, at the Paris Peace Forum, and uh, yesterday afternoon, Angela Merkel admitted that the leaders from 85 countries attending the Paris Peace Forum would certainly fail in writing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 2018. I've been quite impressed by this, uh, this fact. And a few minutes ago, uh, before, uh, Emmanuel Macron spotted the comeback of nationalisms, racism, anti-Semitism, extremism during his welcome speech. But, hopefully there is always a but. Uh, but Angela Merkel and Antonio Guterres both tried yesterday to open windows for hope. First of all, they asked for, they say, the continuous flow of communication between us, civil society, and policymakers, and admitting that they are not the one and only able to find solutions. Secondly, Mr. Guterres said that technologies are a major partner and a major ally to build tomorrow's world. And third, Mrs. Merkel reminded us that peace is always an open option, as soon and only as soon as one is courageous enough to take the first steps toward the other. The three points uh, have also been three key milestones in seriously construction these last two years. We all face hate speech in our everyday lives, generally not from professional haters, I would say. I imagine that all of you in your uh, social network private pages, you have faced uh, issues linked to, to haters. You know what I mean? A uh, post from our uh, friend <clears throat> spotting, for instance, the fact, and this is not my proper words, I will explain you afterwards, that all the Uber drivers come from the same suburbs. How can they afford such cars? A link with drug drivers, dealers, sorry. You see what I mean. Okay, that's horrible situation. I just mentioned, I live it, I lived it from real with a very, very close friend from my wife. I could have banned him from my social network, from my internet, or insulted him online. I did not. Instead, I used seriously. Seriously is a digital platform to help people uh, learn how to, to dialogue online, but it is not dedicated to illegal purpose. Uh, of course, as soon as you identify illegal purpose, it's important to, to notify them, but it is, this is not our purpose. Just, we are just dedicated to little sparks of everyday online hate. But these little sparks sometimes light major fires. 
These little sparks have a name online. It's called Troll. Seven steps before the dead end of an online conversation that finished generally, generally sorry, with Nazi. No more possible dialogue. So we've created seriously to offer an alternative to hate speech on the internet and social network. Seriously is both a method and a, con a concrete con counter speech tool. Normally, I would like to share with you a demo, but I think that the video doesn't work. That's it, Mike. The video is, uh, doesn't work, no? It's what? It doesn't work. So uh, if you've got uh, a smartphone, you can use your smartphone and go on the internet and you type seriously.ngo or ONG. As soon as you are on that platform, uh, you should see how to use it. The, the, the demo should show that uh, on, one more time, your proper uh, social network, you, are fa you face with hate speech. You go to Seriously and you have access to a fact-checking section with very precise information, with irreproachable sources, organized by theme. Uh, I was supposed to show you uh, 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 anti-Muslim contents uh, on, on the platform, but if you want to have a look, you can uh, you type on anti-Muslim and you will see the information. And sorry, it's in French till now, but uh, we will talk about that, that later on. Then, as soon as you identify the facts checking that are interesting for you, you can go to the second side, the second part, and discover advice from negotiation experts. We have selected all over the world that helps you create, uh, restore dialogue. Uh, we discuss with negotiators who are dedicated to, to find against hostage takers, sorry. As of course, when you, somebody uh, deals with hostage, the idea is not to see if he's, he's stupid or not, is to create the dialogue, and this is a key point for us. And then the third part of Seriously, uh, we've built it thanks to our partners. We gather different kinds of media resources from very serious uh, partners, other using humor, videos, cartoons, etc. Those contents are provided so by all these uh, uh, partners we have selected to be the most relevant per topic. So, and at the end, you can have a summary of all the information you've gathered in order to get back to your social network and give an answer. As a conclusion, uh, uh, you understood that our goal is not to identify who is guilty. Our ambitious ambition is to empower each of us and become a player of this new kind of dialogue. One day or another, every one of us can be a bit of Donald Trump or Marine Le Pen, I would say, here in France. We took 20 years to make them rise. But seriously, we believe that all together, in just a few years, we can invent a brand new model and offer an alternative to hate speech. We can learn again how to have a democratic dialogue in the aim that we, and especially future generation, I have three kids, build together a new model for society. I promise for all of you, it works. Try seriously, never give up seriously. Thank you. <laughs> And now, stay, please. Yes, okay. please stay. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Louis Brooks, who, Brooke, forgive me, who is Managing International Director at Breakthrough Media in the UK, which has done an enormous amount of work working with government in the United Kingdom uh, and with the civic sector in order to produce online campaigns. So over to you, Louis. Fab. So. 
my presentation was all videos. So um, <laughs> thanks, uh, UNESCO. Oh, well, actually, we may have just had a technical innovation just happen. Yeah. So we're going to see if this works. If not, I'm going to talk to you very well. So it fills us with huge amount of hope for UNESCO and looking at our digital culture. Um, so I'm going to open up probably just with a platitude, as it's a conference. Um, in as much as the world is a very complicated place and becoming increasingly complicated. And I think the question that we're grappling with today is how do we respond to that complexity if we want to deliver real, scalable, and sustainable social change? I think that complexity comes out of two areas. We're seeing a lot of central fugal forces where we're seeing a huge amount of convergence and centralization, but also a huge amount of fragmentation. And that leaves us very few ways of responding either from the bottom up or the top up. And I think that's the kind of conversation we could be having in this room here. So, you know, we work all around the world and what I really notice is a huge convergence of lifestyles and interdependencies, but yet at the same time, we have a massive fragmentation of our identities, which we guard ever more fiercely. Um, we have a few platforms which give us the access to the entirety of the world's information and ability to communicate, yet we no longer have a single public discourse. We have many uh, polarizing argumentative discourses. Um, and so in this sort of space then, we haven't got a model for how we should work together, bring government, civil society, um, brands, companies together to achieve social change. And I think that's because we have a uh, stuck in a very uh, Newtonian model uh, of how people interact, a, me a mechanistic model where we see things in terms of simple cause and effect. So for example, in the countering violence extremism space, we also get talk talking about narratives and counter narratives. It's like we conceptualize human beings as billiard balls on a big table and we can knock one ball and maybe send someone to a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left and change the way they think. But actually we know that the way people think, the way they feel, the way they behave is determined by their relationships, by determine the social networks they find themselves in. And instead we don't really bring those insights to bear. So I think we've got um, some uh, videos now. So we look at if we can help bring together civil society and governments to address some of these complicated social issues. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of where I think that's potentially been effective. So uh, some examples of some of the brands and companies and governments we're bringing together. Sorry, next slide. <laughs> So, a model for looking at this. The first is that in this complicated environment, the first thing we need to try and do is help people who can actually catalyze change at the grassroots level. We often talk about collaborations and talk about what civil society could and should do. And I think it's really about finding people who are closest to the issues um, who can actually start to make some movements there. So we spend a huge amount of time using the kind of digital and offline research tools to understand who's gonna impact an issue and how and why they think, feel, and act the way they do. The second step is often to give those people the tools they need to be able to make a change at the grassroots level. Sometimes that's not a massive change. It can be something really small. It can be changing something within a small community group. It might be changing the relationships within a family, but it is a catalytic change. And the people at this grassroots level need every tool at their disposal. They need resources, they need technology, they need content. And that's because they're often facing hostile actors, be it states, extremist groups, um, hate speech, who are very well equipped, including companies as well. These are not, uh, it's not a level playing field. These people are fighting a struggle out there against very well equipped and sophisticated adversaries. And then the last stage in the process we think about is then how can we take these people who are making small catalytic change and connect them into broader ecosystems, the governments, NGOs, looking at uh, the private sector, the big brands, so we can take those small pieces of change and allow policy makers, regulators, security forces, whoever it may be, to take advantage of those small movements to achieve change at scale. Sorry, so next slide. So just one little example here of uh, hate speech that we were seeing a lot of happening from uh, far right communities, particularly in um, eastern Ukraine in the occupied territories. So one of the first things we might do in this situation is try and look at what are the big issues that are driving the debate, which would be everything we've got from online polling and focus groups to social media analytics to understand what are the dividing issues. Next slide, then we're trying to look at try and who are the people that are responding to those issues? How do they segment up? So can we define them by their attitudes and behaviors? 
and then try to understand who these people are online. What do they actually care about? What are they interested in? So in this situation, you might be looking at their interests on Facebook or VK, a kind of platform where you're very public. That's your publicly promoted space. But for the next slide, please, we might also then start to look at their keywords um, and search terms um, so you can understand who their private interior lives are. So once we start to look at those, uh, uh, those groups of people, so you can start to see who's really influential. And we found that for young people who are engaged in uh, uh, far-right discourses and very sort of anti-European, anti-open discourses in eastern Ukraine, the only way we could really reach them was through young online influencers. So people working on social media platforms that are really popular. And so here's the kind of way that we were starting to equip some of these actors to take that challenge for hate speech in the region. Oh, okay, so there is no sound, but I'm going to give you a 30-second rundown here. So these are some kids from Donetsk, which is occupied uh, eastern Ukraine, and they are having a kind of comedy video with some kids from the western side of Ukraine, trying to guess each other's slang. So a really simple piece of content where they're choosing words that they're from their childhood, trying to guess it from that piece earlier on. Um, what was great about this piece of content, though, is it quickly generated around 400,000 views from the eastern bits of Ukraine. But much more importantly, what we could do is help connect up this group of Western Ukrainian influencers with audiences in the occupied territories. So instead of thinking about it, did someone see this piece of content, could we start to construct new types of relationship in the area? Next slide, please. Cheers. Oh, there we go. Some stats, let's carry on through there. Next slide. The really interesting part then was then how do we scale that? So in this situation here, we then pulled together a network of around 100 influencers stretching all the way from Central Asia to Western Europe who started to share each other's content, can push back against disinformation, hate speech, but also do it with the authenticity and a closeness to their audiences. So just one small example where you're starting to build up, identify the people who are closest to the issue, equip them with the tools, the skills, the production capabilities to do something on a small level, and then scale it up through bringing together other networks. We're now trying to connect them up with a range of universities and news sites and TV stations so they can start to push their message into a much broader public discourse. I'm going to um, give one more small, small example uh, now, um, uh, just from a different part of the world. Um, can you press play on this? Cheers. I don't think you can see the subtitles because I'm there. <laughs> so we'll skip over this video. Um, th th that's great. Always just leave it playing. So this guy is a guy from Mosul, and he's talking about um, his experience when uh, the, uh, the liberation was happening. He's a um, Sunni Muslim from Mosul, um, and he had a lot of family sheltering in his house. And he talks about a soldier from the Shia South who came to his house and brought him medicines. And when he brought some medicine for his family, he also came with a bag of oranges. And he's talking about that moment of transformation when they kind of met each other with this bag of oranges and medicine and what it did for his life. So we found this guy um, because he was really influential in his local community. He had a huge amount of connections um, within Mosul and he had paid for the funerals of around 20 Shia Muslims from the south who are part of the Shia mobilizing militias. He would paid for their funerals as part of their effort there. So an incredibly powerful um, uh, personal connection. And he was transforming his community at a very local level. But for us, we wanted to try and put that into the national reconciliation discourse. So we partnered up with um, 10 of the biggest online sites uh, in Iraq to produce content. His story then went viral across the country. And we then managed to get the Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense to then come and talk about this story. And he has now been starting to champion uh, the reconciliation process, and particularly for the young Sunni men who have been sort of uh, held in detention camps over a large amount of period there. So just another example of our simple process of looking to the grassroots, equipping them with skills, resources, and power, and connecting them up to broader ecosystems of change is one way that we can start to respond to a ever more complex world. Thanks. Louis, thank you very much, and a really nice tangible example of what this can look like, and also the process 
um, around doing this kind of work, which I think is absolutely critical. I'm sure there'll be questions, um, and we'll come back to that uh, later. I mean, I, and I think it'd be quite useful for people, especially we've got a big NGO contingent, to just walk through maybe the tools that you use in each of those stages, um, especially with some of the research um, that you do around audience segmentation and, and understanding your uh, targets. But we'll come to that. And um, we've got an amazing panel now. And I, I'm going to ask everybody just to speak to some of the content here and, and just bring to the table your own experiences on this question of collaborations in order to address hate speech. Um, I'm going to start with you, Robbie. Robbie Chacha is um, a program officer at Amnesty International in Kenya and has been doing extremely important work around safety and around dignity in the context of a, of a rising, very dangerous hate speech uh, environment in Kenya. So over to you, Robbie, just a, a few minutes to, to speak to some of what you've heard and, and what you feel is needed in this space. Um, thank you very much, um, Sasha. So um, I think where I want to start from is that uh, the internet is used by people. And uh, what, Louis has, what Louis has mentioned is when you connect people, you're able to have a lot of more power. So just to give it context, Amnesty International, I work for the Safety and Dignity Program within Amnesty International. And basically what we're looking at is uh, in informal settlements, what you have is young people who basically can only vent their frustrations online and on social media. And therefore, every time we got into that space to try and discuss human rights education with them, it became very toxic for them to discuss anything with you if you can't do it online. Um, so part of the collaborative aspect of the work is that uh, as Amnesty, we don't focus largely on the internet space, but our work largely is on human rights education, and therefore there's a bit of, of a context within it. Uh, and in short, what I'm trying to say is that even though we're not in the human rights aspect, we still can engage and make sure that we have a safe space for people to interact. Um, and just to speak to uh, what, what the question ahead is on collaborative approaches, I think the internet needs to have a collaborative form of solutions because uh, the internet is on one side very good, but also has some of the issues like what we're discussing today, hate speech and therefore needs a collaborative solution to some of these issues. And therefore that would mean multidisciplinary, multicultural, multisectoral, uh, multisocial, uh, because most of the people who uh, you know, happen to go through the hate speech online are not basically within the same context of opinion and beliefs and sort of set, set of information. And therefore what we've been able to do is try to get other actors and key players. So for example, in Kenya we have uh, the Kenya Internet uh, the Kenya School of Governance, Kenya School of Internet Governance, which I've gone through, which sort of gave me a, a good idea about what digital rights means for people and how they can be able to engage safely online and also offline. Thank you. Robbie, that's really interesting because you've started to sort of carve out, in a way, uh, a framework for internet governance within a, within a context, so looking at ways in which you create frameworks for uh, different sectors, different disciplines to come to the table, different linguistic traditions, different communities to come to the table. Is there an actual framework then that works uh, with the internet sector in Kenya to address some of the problems of hate speech? Is there such a semi or formalized structure in, in place? Um, so I'm not aware of any formalized structure at the moment, but what uh, we have done in Amnesty is, so in the, in the communities we have uh, the community networks, what they call themselves the community justice centers. Uh, so what you have as justice centers, a, a group of young people who come together to discuss issues about their community. And therefore, the only way we've been able to manage to get through into the community and discuss issues of, uh, of hate speech is through, through the justice centers and just building their capacity on uh, what hate speech actually means and also develop their theory in terms of what the law provides uh, in terms of your constitutional rights and what the internet space could be for you. It's really interesting. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Tony now to say a few words. Tony Glavinitz is Director of Operations at the Dangerous Speech Project in the, in the US. And Susan Benish is well known to many of us. I, I'm going to ask you just to tell us, so at what point does hate speech become dangerous? And what do you think is missing in terms of addressing that pivotal point? Sure. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so at the Dangerous Speech Project, uh, we study dangerous speech, um, which is speech that makes it more likely that violence will happen between groups of people. 
we determine this by looking at five elements of a, of a speech act in context. Uh, the message itself, uh, what's actually being communicated, uh, who is the speaker, uh, who is the audience, um, whether it's the audience that the speaker intended to reach or the audience that is actually being reached by the message, uh, what is the social and historical context that the speech is happening in, um, and how is it being disseminated? And of course, the internet is a really important part of that. Um, and so we draw that, this distinction and we use the, the term dangerous speech instead of hate speech um, because hate speech is, is a really challenging term. It's a broad category and there's very little consensus in terms of, of what is hate speech. You know, one person or one government's uh, hate speech could of course be another person's uh, legally protected opinions. Um, and, and often the idea of hate speech is misused in ways that are harmful to democracy. Um, so because of that, um, we typically, you know, we've talked a little bit about um, how legal regulation isn't enough to address these problems and we need to find collaborative solutions. Um, and part of that is because regulation typically uh, involves taking down speech after it's already been posted or publicized. Um, and there's only so much you can do in that context. Uh, at that point, often the harm of, uh, of speech has already been done. Uh, it has likely already reached you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Um, and taking down speech uh, there's, doesn't do much to change the behavior of the person uh, or organization that is putting it out. Uh, in some cases, it also takes that content away from researchers and law enforcement uh, for un better understanding what's happening in a certain situation. Um, so for the past couple of years, we've been looking at strategies for responding to hatred and to dangerous speech uh, that individuals and organizations are using. Uh, projects like the ones that we heard from today uh, that scale much better than takedown uh, because anyone can do it. Uh, projects that can be proactive and that we hope are better at creating behavioral change. We're not sure yet, but that's something that we're studying. So have you got any examples of those types of products or responses? That would be really interesting to hear. Yeah, so uh, some of the types of projects that we've been um, studying, and we'll be publishing a paper on the findings of our research, hopefully before the end of this year. Um, counter speech is a really significant uh, category of approaches, um, which falls into a couple of different uh, types of counter speech. Um, some counter speakers are looking to educate uh, producers of hateful or dangerous content uh, about why what they're saying is problematic, the impact that it has uh, on the community. Um, others are just trying to shame the speaker into uh, apologizing or to taking down the content, uh, making it clear that what they're saying does not fit into the norms of the community that, uh, that they're speaking it into. Um, another approach is amplification, uh, taking speech that may have been intended or delivered to a specific community and blowing it up, sometimes literally, uh, on billboards, for example, as one project in Brazil did, um, to uh, make the community face what is a larger community, uh, face what's being said, what's happening uh, around them, um, and creating an opportunity to have conversation about that in a, in a bigger context. Um, and another one that has been really interesting to us is uh, projects that seek to support the targets and victims of uh, online harassment or hatred. Um, projects like HeartMob that uh, allow third parties to step in and uh, stand between uh, a harasser and their targets uh, by responding to speech online, by cataloging it, reporting it to platforms, um, uh, formal processes to help uh, individuals targeted by harmful speech online uh, respond to it in ways that don't rely on them having uh, the energy to uh, to respond to a deluge of, of harmful speech. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Um, I, I'm going to pass the floor now to Nalaka Gunawardene. I'm sorry if that's terribly badly pronounced. 
um, who's a journalist and a communications specialist uh, working in Sri Lanka, but also covering some of the regional challenges of, of, of hate speech. And I know that you were talking to me earlier about some of the uh, potential negative side effects in more repressive environments of the removal of content and, and other approaches. Again, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on what can work. Well, thank you. Uh, I think just as we, uh, we agree collaboration is important, the local context is, is also equally important. And, and that's the point I want to make, uh, particularly from my uh, own uh, situation, Sri Lanka, a uh, country of 21 million people, of whom a third now online. And it's also a post-conflict society where a civil war ended uh, nearly a decade ago. So we are a very polarized society polarized along political, ethnic, and religious lines. So there has always been hate speech in our society, but the, the advent and proliferation of uh, web and social media has boosted or turbocharged the dissemination of hate speech. So we now find that it spreads much more intensely and, and rapidly. Uh, civil society response uh, uh, how does civil society respond? On their own, they are doing various things to promote uh, harmony online, responsible social media use, uh, and, and also exploring uh, strategies for counter speech. Uh, we draw inspiration from campaigns like the Flower Campaign in Myanmar, where social media users uh, rallied together and, and had a counter speech campaign using manga images with flowers. Uh, things like that have inspired us and we are doing similar efforts and campaigns. But what is uh, also happening is that civil society is engaging platforms, the global, the large platforms like Facebook, because one of the failures uh, particularly for local languages like mine and many other Asian languages is that the platforms simply do not have or do not appear to have the capacity to adequately monitor and ensure compliance with their own community standards. Because they lack the language capability, they lack the local context, and so civil society, several of us, uh, both um, uh, NGOs as well as some of the civic-minded tech companies have come together uh, and, and engage Facebook, for example, the biggest platform in my country, trying to step up the content monitoring both locally as well as on the part of, uh, of, uh, part of uh, Facebook. Because we realize that they simply uh, don't understand. And either they err on the side of caution and take down legitimate content or they let very explosive, dangerous speech or hate speech, let, uh, let it continue um, because uh, they, they don't realize that it's actually violating their own community standards. So things like that. Uh, and and the, the legal side, we are also trying to ask the government not to introduce any more regulations. We have enough and more laws and regulations, the problem has been in poor enforcement. So we don't want criminalization of hate speech and in, in that, uh, in the guise of doing that, cracking down on legitimate political criticism and, and uh, that is a real danger in immature democracies like ours. Thank you so much. It's extremely important, isn't it? And you've raised one of the roles that civil society organizations can play, an educative role not of kids, not of the public, but actually both of government and, in fact, of, of the tech companies themselves, providing expertise, providing context, providing um, and, and actually advocating uh, for the moderation of, of content in a way that's, that's um, uh, contextual to the problem. Um, so th this is a set of functions, I think, absolutely right. I mean, Alexandria, you were at the heart of dealing with requests from government, requests from civil society. It would be quite interesting to hear from you. Alexandria Walden is public policy and government relations advisor at Google, based out of the US and has been at the heart of um, some of the challenges facing the, the, the mega companies in addressing um, hate, uh, terrorism, other, other threats online. 
How do you see the relationship between the companies and these other stakeholders? Mm -hmm. What kind of collaboration do you need in order to address these problems? What would you like to see more of? What would you like to see less of? How do you feel this needs to work at scale? Sure. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, and I sort of want to pick up on a few threads that folks have touched on. Um, at YouTube, we are deeply troubled by the hate and violence in the world. And that's why we have responsible policies in place to make sure that we are um, removing content uh, that violates our global policies. And so that's one of the core ways that we deal with these issues on the platform. Sasha talked about this at the beginning, that removal is still an important piece, but it is not a solution to the problem. Um, but still, as we've talked about, there is speech that is dangerous, and we have a policy that prohibits hate speech on the platform, on YouTube, uh, and across Google services. Um, for those policies, in, in, the, in place, we have flagging systems so that members of the community can flag content that violates our policies, and then we also remove under local law. And so that means that what we're really doing is making sure that in a local context, we are working with local partners to understand what hate speech, for example, looks like um, in that jurisdiction, and then making sure that we're respecting local law and then globally removing across the platform where things violate our policies. So that's sort of one piece of it, but we recognize that broadly, we need government and civil society at the table with us as we're dealing with these issues so that we can be part of the solution um, and that we're dealing with experts in, as part of that process. Um, some of the ways that we're doing that um, are things like the EU hate speech code of conduct where we have engaged with government and with civil society through a formal process um, that includes transparency so that all of the actors can sort of understand what our processes look like. Um, and I think it's been sort of eye-opening for everyone uh, who's been engaged in it. So that's sort of one example, one model that we've, that we've looked at. Um, but we also have things like our Trusted Flagger program where we work with experts around the world on specific topics who help to educate us as a company on what hate speech might look like in a particu particular local context. Um, some of the things that have been brought up. We make sure that we're working with folks on the ground because we recognize that we might not have the specific context in each case. Um, and so we do that through Trusted Flagger and then sep separately through partnerships um, with all sorts of organizations. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to hit on Creators for Change, which um, I think relates back to some of the programs that were highlighted earlier on. Creators for Change is really the proactive way that we're dealing across the platform with, with narrative. So we can remove content that's bad, but ultimately that content represents ideas that exist in the world. And so how do we change the narratives around hate and extremism and xenophobia. We do that through partnering with creators on our platform, really harnessing the strength and the value of what our platform is, um, and resourcing those creators uh, to make sure that they can use their voice on our platform to distribute positive messages, um, to, to share information, and really it's about storytelling uh, to make sure that people can share their experiences directly and authentically across the platform. So again, it's partnership with government and partnership with civil society to make sure that we are doing everything we can in the private sector to create a safe space on our platform. Alexandra, thank you so much. And Creators for Change, in a way, is what you were talking about, Louis, in terms of uh, creating networks yeah. of influencers. These are young, very cool, very influential yeah. individuals um, who have reach within various different, mainly youth, demographics and I think you know they are if empowered in the right way potentially disproportionately impactful on some of these challenges we've had the privilege of working with the creators of change for change program to deliver educational content digital educational content to kids across the UK and now increasingly across Europe and of course they're more likely to be interested in their peers and in, in me or you at this stage. So really interesting ways in which to mobilize both content uh, creativity, but also influence networks. Um, so some of these ideas now, and I think we've, we've covered a number of, of, of uh, issues, but I just to 
spark now the public debate, and I'd like to, to hear from all of you any questions you might have, any comments you might have. But as we think about collaborations, is this something that we need to be thinking about creating a framework for? Does every country need its multi-stakeholder uh, uh, internet governance forum? Do we need a space where civil society comes together with the companies, with government? Um, how, what would that look like without it becoming uh, unified, too stodgy to make any difference? How, how would that work? And so just as a challenge, I suppose, to the audience, how do we do collaboration in a way that could be impactful? Any questions? There's a gentleman over there in the back and then one here. If I could ask you to just to say your name and your organization before you speak. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Xavier Brandao. So I work on a project uh, which is a kind of uh, fact-checking website uh, against prejudices and misconceived ideas. Uh, it's called répondreaupréjugés.com like answerprejudices.com, it's in French. Uh, and so this project is, to, to me, I think, behind hate speech and dangerous speech, there are prejudices and misconceptions and ignorance. So I think this is at the root. So I think we would need, I would like to ask your opinion about that. Uh, I think we would need also to work on prejudices on various subjects uh, and also to kind of um, push people who are moderate and who are not hateful to uh, go online, go on public spaces, go on uh, comments on websites, uh, uh, on news sites, and go on social network and counter speech. So to me, what I would like to ask is, do you think we could start a campaign to uh, push people to take back the internet and counter hate speech uh, together. So that's, yeah, that's my question. That's a great question. How do we mobilize that? After all, we just need to mobilize a small proportion of the majority and we'd have it, wouldn't we? We'd, out, uh, we'd outdo them. Um, I'm gonna bring that back to the panel in one second. If I can take the second question first. Yes, sir, over here. My name is Joseph Omotoso. I'm the project coordinator of Omotoso Group France. I'm privileged to be in your midst today, but I would like to share a point with you concerning the hate speech. When we look at this hate speech in general, I've been working now for decades on the issue of hate speech. I discover so many things. Firstly, every sector are victims of hate speech. Most especially, NGO, political institutions, religious institutions, business institutions, education. Everybody, every sector are victims. But I now discovered one thing that we can work on in general. most especially on internet. A speech can come in, a ver in various ways, but it depends on how, it depends on how we work on the information we receive. In all my operation, I used to base it on biblical trend. I'm sorry to quote a biblical trend today, but it can enlighten us a little bit. Colossians 4, 6 says, I'm sorry. It says, let your word always be gracious, ceasing with salt, so that you will know how you should answer each person. That was what Bible said in Colossians 4, 6. Why am I quote this Bible trend? Is that many things are happening in the world of today's. We base much of our reasoning on false information. A lot of things that are not real. But 
because, uh, that are not real. A lot of information are not real. But the moment we heard about that, instead of working out deeply on the information we had, Canton speech will come on the internet. So in order to solve all this multivarious problem, we need to work on our how we receive information, how we react to the information, so that the world can be at peace in general. I'm sorry to take much of your time, but most important things therein we need to work on is the way we react to the speech we had in the public in general. Thank you. Thank you so much for these important questions. So I'm going to I'm going to pass them to the floor now. Perhaps we can get responses from two or three of our panel. Anybody would like to take up the first uh, question uh, campaign to take back uh, the internet? Yeah, I mean I can only agree. Uh, what's amazed me uh, in my own society is how very ordinary, apparently reasonable housewives, school children, or grandmas and grandpas have been radicalize when they go online, especially social media, by certain content that they see and they uncritically consume. Because it panders to existing prejudices. You are very, very right. And uh, it invokes the idea of an enemy, a perceived enemy, or perceived threats. So I think it appeals deep inside us to that reptile brain that we, many of us have suppressed with culture and civilization. But so, so that we don't underrate the challenge we face, it is as fundamental as appealing uh, to that reptile brain uh, residual in us. How do we do that? By identifying and understanding the prejudices and systematically through education, through culture, through discussion and debate, trying to deal with those prejudices, unpack them, and, and, and not dismiss, but to engage in difficult conversations. This is, I think, uh, both offline and online. We have these prejudices that are fueling and turning normal human beings into bundles of prejudice and suspicion. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Louis, please. I think there's a really interesting opportunity to do public campaigning around hate speech. I, I suppose the risk is that you entrench views. So one of the things we know is that if you tell someone who believes something deeply that they're wrong, they believe it more. And we have 40, 50 years of psychological evidence in every single sector of life. Yet when it comes to talking about extremism or hate speech, we are happy to put that aside and then say, well, no, we just need to you know, help someone understand the reality. And that's not how human beings uh, work it's, and it's our hardwiring. So I think there are lots of, having said that, we cannot enter into a he said, she said culture war, but there are things you can start to do. So people have looked at different ways of how you can create the norms within certain communities online. So are there certain social sanctions that you can um, incentivize so that people feel more ashamed of doing something? So perhaps you're not trying to convince them that they're wrong. You're not maybe trying to change their prejudice or misconception. You're trying to limit the behavior initially by saying it's socially unacceptable within a certain group of people. And then you might have a chance of slowly starting to shift how they think and feel in the longer t over a longer period. But for that, that means we have to work much more closely with uh, the people uh, who are part of those communities. And so I think the big challenge in designing one of those campaigns is if we're worried about xenophobia or racism or hate speech online, how are you going to work with the alt-right in America? Are you going to be happy to work with the evangelical movement or be it uh, another kind of large institutional structure that's ready to work with these people who they already trust? Um, and I think the danger is that we set up a oppositional um, argumentative discourse again. So yes, but we've got to be prepared to be much more agnostic about the people we work with and the objectives of the campaign. So I, I think very important points here because we talk about, uh, obviously fact checking is extremely important, but, but it is true we've seen that myth busting uh, tends, tends to fall on deaf ears. It's a very difficult thing to do well. And, and I think that we're, beyond information warfare, I think we are in narrative uh, warfare. 
And ultimately, that is sort of uh, is focused on the othering uh, dynamic, which I think is actually, you know, where we see the strength of polarization and hate online is in uh, creating these dynamics of very polarized us and them uh, in and out uh, group, which I, I agree with you, appeals to something very fundamental in uh, the human being uh, and our psyche. And it is in confusing that binary notion, that black and white notion of us and them, that really the challenge resides. And, and the complexity, as you, as you said earlier, Louise, is, is everything. How do we bring back complexity into the picture? Because otherwise, I think our counter speech, our counter narrative uh, work can, in fact, be deeply counterproductive. And we've done a lot of work to evaluate the impact of counter speech. And I think it's important to note that while it always feels like it's a positive thing, it can, in fact, be extremely pernicious and negative. And we need to be very careful and clear about what it is that works and what, in fact, doesn't work in counter speech and be systematic in our evaluation and in sharing that with the wider sector, something that I hope we can do more. But I think this brings us really nicely into the next part of our session, which is on education. Um, and exactly that sort of us and them dynamic uh, that happens. How do we inoculate that uh, next generation from those prejudices, from falling into us and them narratives, from falling into that in the online world in particular? where that tends to be hypercharged, as you said earlier. So we have uh, two speakers who are going to talk to us quickly about projects that they've uh, worked on, uh, which are education projects. And firstly, I'd like to ask uh, Christina uh, Luciacci to come and join us. Christina is the Vice President of Group of the European Youth for Change in Romania. Uh, and has been uh, leading on a project called Turn, the Turn Online Initiative. Um, and we have had the privilege of working very closely together on a digital citizenship uh, education program. Thank you, Sasha, for introducing me. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Christiana, and uh, today I'm representing here uh, the group of European Youth for Change NGO, uh, funded in, uh, back in 2010 in Bucharest, Romania, and acting at uh, local, national, and international level. Uh, our main aim is to encourage uh, di digital citizenship, entrepreneurship, uh, and uh, human rights uh, in our communities. And uh, today I would like to present you uh, two of the approaches uh, that our NGO uh, promotes. And one of them is uh, the digital citizenship education that we uh, lately improved uh, by joining uh, Young Digital Leaders Initiative uh, an initiative uh, created by uh, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue together with Google. Uh, this uh, is an Europe-wide uh, education project aiming to empower young people through digital citizenship, critical thinking, and uh, media literacy skills uh, to become uh, tomorrow's digital leaders. Uh, the project uh, was created in order to equip young people with the skills they need to be safe, uh, powerful, and also efficient in the online sector. Uh, the pilot phase uh, was implemented in three countries, in Romania, Italy, and Sweden. And uh, today I would like to share with you some of the results of this initiative uh, in uh, Romania, uh, where we implemented the pilot uh, in a high school uh, in one of uh, the Romanian cities, uh, Oradea. Uh, in Romania, um, it, uh, this uh, initiative proved to be a, a great success, not only for uh, the participants, but also for uh, us as organizers. And I would like to share these results uh, based on uh, some approaches that we used uh, from different perspectives, from uh, a student's perspective, from uh, uh, teachers, and also from uh, the parents' point of view. Uh, first, from a student's perspective, uh, bringing non-formal education in a formal context uh, was very appreciated by them. Uh, participants were very enthusiastic about this initiative and uh, showed their interest in uh, having this kind of uh, non-formal workshops on digital thematic organized uh, at least one time per semester so that they can uh, um, keep in touch with uh, the latest uh, digital trends and also to learn how to protect themselves in the online field. Uh, also, the uh, overall results showed a 95% increase in student confidence uh, that they understand what, what uh, the filter bubbles are. Uh, next si slide, please. 
Okay. Uh, parents also had a very good uh, receptivity level towards this initiative, uh, stating that before this event, they were not fully aware of uh, the danger that uh, uh, their children can be exposed to when um, uh, being uh, online. Um, yeah. Um, uh, the overall results show that a 56% increase in parent confidence that they know how and why to flag or report social media content. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, teachers proved to be very open towards the non-formal approach and towards this uh, uh, workshop format and also show their interest in the, maybe having a, a learning module so that they can improve their skills in delivering content for, the, for their uh, students. Uh, so that they can further offer assistance in uh, the digital sector for uh, high schoolers. As a conclusion, we truly think that uh, introducing digital education in uh, high school curricula would uh, really improve the level of understanding of what uh, online sector means, uh, and also it can help and have a huge impact in the high schoolers' multilateral uh, development. Meanwhile, empowering uh, teachers with knowledge so that they can uh, deliver relevant content to their students could be uh, one of the best approaches to efficiently multiply uh, the results that we have through this initiative. Uh, in the second part of my uh, speech, I would like also to present another initiative of our organization. If you can change the slide, please. Uh, it is about the Turn Online project, a uh, strategic partnership uh, that is organized uh, together with seven other organizations uh, from, uh, the United, uh, from the European Union. Uh, the project is aiming to um, empower digitalization uh, of um, NGOs promoting peace and human rights. Uh, the project was funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. And in this matter, we ran a survey. Uh, next slide. Uh, we ran a survey in the participating uh, countries as we wanted to see uh, what challenges do youth workers uh, face uh, in their uh, daily activities. As you can see in the graphic uh, on the screen, uh, there are still uh, many needs that have to be tackled uh, in the online sector when talking about uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, lack of initiative uh, from our point of view uh, in a fast-changing environment might discourage uh, people in becoming digital. Next slide. Uh, important to mention is also a survey that uh, was ran uh, worldwide that showed an important fact regarding encryption of data that is used uh, by non-governmental organization, organizations. And as you can see, uh, half of the respondent organizations uh, are using uh, encryption technologies to protect their data in the online field. And uh, this would definitely, uh, uh, would definitely express the need of raising awareness towards uh, data protection in the NGO sector. And now I would like to finish my intervention with an open question uh, to the audience, uh, meaning uh, protecting your identity in the digital field is something that we seem to, for to forget, but should we? Thank you. I would definitely say no. Let's not forget that. I'm totally paranoid. Comes with the job. Now, um, if I may, we are going to invite now our second speaker, Delphine uh, Schramm, um, from the association Le Bal here in France, doing really interesting work. She's going to talk to us about an interesting project, The Real Identity of Cats, which is a fantastic title, but it's uh, really looking at uh, methods uh, used by conspiracy theorists. Conspiracy theory is, of course, a huge challenge uh, in the mobilization of hate. Uh, and, and of course, mounting uh, every day online. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a context of uh, how the project has uh, been developed. So I work for Le Bal, which is a non-profit organization based in Paris and dedicated to contemporary images. We are uh, an exhibition place, a publication and reflective place, and an educational place. And it's within our educational programs that we have developed and worked with students to create this film. So 
For 10 years now, uh, we are conducting visual literacy programs, working in DIF with 2,000 young people every year, mainly from priority education areas. And the goal is to make them understand the word uh, through images and to develop the critical thinking. So uh, in our educational programs, we obey three main lines. Uh, this is our educational approach. Uh, which is first the analysis of images to make students understand that there are different types of images, press images, artistic images, archive images that obey to different usages and codes. Second is uh, to make them experience the chain of production of these images, the way an image is produced, the way it's broadcasted, and then the way it's received can influence the way we read it. And third is the creation of a collective project. Uh, so we work with 50 artists per year uh, with the students to create a film, a newspaper, or a book. So uh, I would like, like to, to show, next slide please, the, the film. So unfortunately I don't have the time to present it to you, but I invite you to see it on the internet. Um, so the film that was made, uh, The Real Identity of Cats, uh, was made by a group of students from a high school of the suburbs of uh, Paris with, uh, within our educational project. And it happened at a very specific time because it was uh, in 2015 after Charlie Hebdo's attacks. And a lot of teachers with whom we were working with told us that their speech, their voice was called into question by the students who would rather believe uh, any other sources of, inf of information and mainly, especially, fake news. So they decided to work on uh, this uh, idea of this concept of fake news. And they made this film, so what it is about, uh, well, the cats dominate the world if you didn't know it yet. And uh, the first four minutes of the movie is the theory, and the last four minutes is the methodology they used. So what was our educational approach? Uh, we followed, of, of course, the three main lines I presented before. And then for 10 hours, they analyzed different kind of articles, different websites, different images. Uh, they compared the one that was from conspiracy websites, the one that were press uh, information. Uh, they learned how to search for information, how to search for authors. And then for 10 hours, they created this film. So what was the methodology? Next slide, please. Uh, they, so as I said, the first part was the construction of this theory, and the second part was the deconstruction of it. So you would see on the second part the 10 ingredients to, do, to make a good conspiracy video. That is to say, for example, to choose a good structure, start with historical events and then go to emotions to choose a scary music, to choose a robotic voice that would lead the story and not one of their own, um, to choose to put some real facts, some unverified facts, and so false facts. And what happened, what happened then? Uh, that's the interesting part. Uh, the students decided to uh, broadcast it the, only, uh, the, the first part only first on the internet to see what kind of website would use it, would display it. Uh, and, then, and, and they noticed that mainly conspiracy website that they had uh, f found before would use it. But also they seen, they've seen how they could manipulate their friends uh, because most of them believed it was a real conspiracy video. Uh, now you will find the, the film in the hall on the internet and uh, it's really used as an educational tool uh, within schools in France. Last slide, please. Uh, I would just to, like to conclude with uh, a spotlight on this platform, Ercilia, which, uh, which gathers actually our 10 years of experience uh, within our educational programs. So it, uh, it's a collaborative and transdisciplinary platform, digital educational platform, uh, that uh, goal is to uh, make young people uh, understand how the images works again and to train them to become active and conscious observers critical thinkers to become a better citizens thank you very much
Delphine, it's fantastic, actually. I think the process of actually creating the problem is a really interesting way of getting people to really understand, you know, what is it that they're looking at and what might be coming at them. Um, I'd be really interested now to hear from our panel, but really to open up the floor. I'm very conscious of the fact that we started late. Um, and, and so I think we'll mix it up and start to take some questions soon. But I, I just wanted to put out there because digital education, of course, takes many different forms. Um, but I think it's important to have something of a framework for it. I think there's a pyramid of uh, digital education that we need to be aware of. At the very baseline is digital safety. So how to use the internet safely, everything from passwords and online sharing and phishing and scamming emails. Most digital education offered to kids these days is sort of at that level. The second tier is what we would call digital resilience. So it would be something around uh, critical thinking capabilities, media literacy, social behaviors online, peer safeguarding, and, and some of the sort of law of the online space, if you like, what's allowed, what's not, and so, so on. Really about starting to create safe and active participation online and communities online. I think the, the top tier uh, and, there's, and there's some work in that direction. The top tier is what we would call sort of digital uh, democracy, which is really activist. It's how do we create um, social uh, and media activism, community engagement, and digital democracy. Our lives are being lived out online, our social, political, associative lives. It is extraordinary that in this day and age, and I say this mainly because we are now uh, you know, in this uh, great house and being hosted here by UNESCO, my plea would be, I'd be interested in your thoughts, how do we start to universalize digital citizenship education at a time where our lives are lived out in that space? This doesn't exist. And so while these wonderful projects are happening, they're happening um, in, a, in a very small way still in terms of the reach that they have. Um, have we been hacked? It would be so exciting if we'd just been hacked. Um, but, and, and of course, I think that the, the big internet companies have an extremely important role to play here, uh, both in assisting the development of digital education programming, which they are doing, and, and we've had the privilege of working with Google on Be Internet Citizens, which is a digital citizenship program on, on, on young digital leaders. Again, reaching now numbers of people in the UK, perhaps up to 70,000 kids this year, but nonetheless, that's a drop in the ocean. And I think here is where collaboration comes into play. How do we advocate for governments to be taking digital citizenship education more seriously? What is the role um, uh, for our, us collaboratively to achieve that goal. Um, I'd be very interested to hear any of your thoughts. I'm going to pass that to uh, my, my panel and then out to the floor. To start? Yeah, I can start. Um, I just wanted to quickly, yes, highlight the Be Internet Citizens. We have benefited from working closely with ISD on that project, and it's something that we've launched throughout the UK and is interesting to us in a broader set of jurisdictions across Europe. Um, and we've also piloted something similar um, in the US where we are similarly um, doing work in uh, middle schools and high schools uh, with a set of curriculum that we've developed with the university. So we are spending a lot of resources um, trying to figure out what we can do to, to contribute to the ecosystem to make sure that when people are going online, they are going online with a set of critical thinking skills to evaluate the content that they're looking at. Um, so that's the one piece I just wanted to make sure I highlighted quickly. Would you like to take that on? Yeah, I think, uh, I think whether it's analog or digital, the core values of citizenship are the same. Uh, and as societies gradually become more digital, uh, we have a lot of unfinished work in the analog era. We haven't built enough civic consciousness and citizenship skills, uh, whether or not we go digital. So let's, let's begin from the, the core values, you know, agreeing to disagree and participation and, and negotiating and navigating uh, multiple points of view and perspectives and, and respecting when a decision has been reached. Uh, and, and accommodating minorities and, and all that and more. The values, I think, are, are fundamental and universal. It's just that we haven't, in many of our societies, done enough uh, to, to build that consciousness. 
So we have a lot of work to do. And, and when we go on digital, there are additional tools and, and those can be used to reach and, and engage more people, more individuals, uh, more effectively in many different innovative ways. So that's the benefit, the digital dividend that we can perhaps tap into. And uh, then the other, the more utilitarian um, things like, you know, how, to, how can our online experience be safe and all that comes next. But the core uh, function is how do we have respectful engagement and participation. And, and this, there is no, uh, there's no shortcut. We have, to, we have to go back to the first principles, I think. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, but uh, yes, over to you, please. Yeah, yeah um, I wouldn't say that we are internet citizens. I would say that we are citizens at the digital, digital age, which is not exactly the same. And we are here at UNESCO. Uh, maybe most of the people who live in this planet consider that they are member of the United Citizens Organization. But uh, they, they receive the tools of democracy, but they've never learned how to use this tool. And sometimes these tools become weapons. And honestly, we won't be able to face tomorrow's world if we are not able, each of us, to teach our children how to use these tools, because every minute we present ourselves as if we wanted to be elected by our peers on the social networks. We vote every second when we click, when we like something, and we don't know to use this tool. So we have to, and there is no solution without education. And as some said this morning, education for all of the, our inhabitants is the first time of the mammal's history that the, the youngest teach the oldest. And this is a major shift for our human beings, and we, are, we have to solve that. And your videos is a fantastic example because it's not theoretical education, it's very practical education. It's what we've tried to do with seriously too, and I consider that we have to go on on that path, and, and there is still a lot to do, of course. Yeah, so one project that, uh, that we're really excited about at the Dangerous Speech Project is, um, I mentioned we've spent the past couple of years studying um, online responses to hatred, uh, and we've just uh, started the process of writing a manual for counter speakers uh, based on ethnographic research of uh, people who are doing counter speech uh, all over the world. Um, Range, sort of starting from how do you define what success looks like, what does effectiveness look like, um, starting with some of those basic principles about how, you know, how do you go online and intentionally engage with people who are producing harmful content while protecting yourself and keeping yourself safe. Um, you know, how do you tailor your responses? Uh, how do you decide when and how to engage with people? Um, and how do you recruit others? How uh, can you work together with other people um, to support each other uh, and strategize to increase your effectiveness? Um, so, like I said, that's very early stages, like we wrote the outline of the table of contents a week ago, um, but we're hoping to publish that sometime next year. That's very exciting. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, Sasha. So I'd like to agree with uh, what Nalaka says in terms of uh, us starting from the analog, you know, bit of it. And basically what this means is that in an African setting, basically, the analog setting of things would be, you know, respect for your elders, uh, when to speak, what to say, should be very respectful in a very dignified manner. And therefore the problem is that does not reflect in what uh, some of the conversations we have digitally. Um, and so you have situations where in Kenya, for example, since we're very political and we have so many political parties and political opinions, uh, people tend to take their vitriol on social media. And in most instances, this has led to even people, you know, small groups of gangs being created online, uh, which therefore ref reflect in the community and they're able to fight. So in Amnesty's context, the approach we're taking on this is since uh, hate speech, 
touches on about uh, six constitutional human rights uh, within our constitution. We therefore do human rights education and we package it in the sense of edu action. So instead of, it, instead of it being just education, it becomes education that would then lead you to act. So as I mentioned, we have social justice centers uh, within Nairobi and within the country, so, uh, which are not pre representative of the communities that we, we work with. So we might train about or, or educate about 10 of them and advise them to also become ambassadors online and are able to therefore do st such things as fact checking and also make sure that the conversations that happen online are, are very uh, you know, credible and very uh, dignified in terms of people relating with each other. Uh, but then the other aspect of it, that the other aspect of things that we've also gotten to, to interact with is a lot of what people talk about online is based on what they see in the environments. And therefore, Amnesty working in informal settlements, most of the, most of the communications that you have and, and vital that is being spilled over online does not happen in the context of the middle class. It's usually in the very lower classes, and therefore it takes uh, us, for example, to research and understand what exactly are some of the issues they are facing, and therefore when you tackle some of these issues on their behalf or for them, or help them advocate on these issues, it becomes easier for them to become constructive um, online. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm uh, cognizant. We've got a, a question over there. Um, two questions at the back here. If I could, uh, the lady over there. Yeah. Um, my name is Zahra Mahdi. I'm uh, working for Bahrain Center for Human Rights. Actually, Sorry, could you just speak it a little closer into the mic? Okay. I would like to know how can we differentiate between the uh, hate speech and the freedom of expression or freedom of speech? Actually, I'm working on a project on, on this topic, but when we are talking to the people who are uh, spreading the hate speech over the internet, they are saying that this is like my opinion and I would like to share it. So I'm using it. They don't know, they are using this unconsciously. They don't know that their uh, opinion or whatever they are posting is considered as hate speech. So I need not, like tips to know exactly when to consider this as hate speech when it is like freedom of expression. Thank you. I'm being told that we're being evicted from the room, so I'm afraid one last question and then we're, we're going to have to be done. Hi, my name is Mojirayo Ogulanonkanga. I'm from Nigeria. I have a law firm, MON Legal. Interestingly, she broached what I was about to say. What I was going to say is it's good to collaborate with government and then bringing together the CSOs and private individuals. And one of the things that I believe that we should consider is the fact that... Um, a government can go overboard in what it defines as its speech. So when collaborating, you sh it should be one of the foremost issues that how do you differentiate between as freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, and what you consider as hate speech. Because I can tell you that what's been going on in Nigeria is that they pick a journalist and they, 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 the security agencies are uh, on their necks and then putting them behind um, detention and stating that a particular information um, is defined as hate speech. And the best way that governments have uh, been able to justify such detentions is by the use of the anti-terrorism law, which I believe is mostly used around the world today. So I think when we're engaging, we should always put this as the foremost. Thank you. Thank you so much. So two quick responses. Uh, can I ask you to take that on, Nalaka, and... Uh, can I answer the first question? If, uh, yeah, it, it is uh, it's an interesting question. In fact, uh, earlier on we alluded to the difficulty of defining hate speech. Uh, freedom of expression includes the right to express unpopular ideas that may shock, that may offend or disturb certain listeners. And, and, and we need to safeguard that, that right. Uh, as um, Salman Rushdie said, the, without the freedom to offend, freedom of expression ceases to exist. So the challenge is in legal terms uh, to keep the definitions as narrow and tight as possible so as to allow uh, the broadest range of conversations, dissent, discussion, debate without that being criminalized. Legally, the definitions 
uh, that are favored in liberal uh, societies is if there is specific incitement, then that is considered uh, hate speech. We can perhaps have an offline conversation about it after this session. Thanks. Thank you, Guillaume. Last just, word to you. I, I would just like to say that uh, the question of offense is very, very important, and you can you can't define offense by law as it's a personal feeling. So the, the way we've worked at Seriously is to work on the feeling of people in order to just to say when you are offensed, because generally it's the first step to, to, to make anti-troll, I would say, to, to, to have quieter conversation online. So our topic is not to define what is uh, legally uh, hate speech or not, it's to evaluate the level of offense for individuals. I want to thank everybody. It's been a very interesting panel. And, and just a last note, because I think what we've seen here is the range of activity that civil society can and should and must be involved in, in in responding to this challenge of hate speech. From advocacy, which I think is important, policy advocacy, not just in relation to government, but also in relation to the companies. Uh, we've talked about the role in terms of providing expertise, deep understanding, contextual and political and social understanding, desperately needed in this space. We've talked about the educative function, educating not just young people, uh, but society writ large, also educating policymakers in how they go about approaching uh, these problems from a legislative standpoint. We've talked about speech, counter speech, and the need to get that right. We've also talked about being able to empower counter speakers with the right sorts of tools. We've talked about networks of influencers responding through uh, amplified uh, engagements online and offline. Uh, and we've talked about witnessing, reporting these things and creating systems for reporting. So there's a whole range of important activity desperately needed in this space. And I think I would just say, we desperately need to be connecting our dots more. So I would invite all of you, uh, we do have a set of resources, whether it's digital citizenship, education resources available for educators, or in fact, uh, manuals for counter speech, manuals for uh, evaluating counter speech that are available for civil society organizations. And all of us up here would be very, very pleased to share those with you. So please approach us uh, so that we can start to work together. As you said, that collective campaign definitely needs to happen. And so we're open to trying to start to coordinate that, organize it, uh, facilitate something that makes us more than some of our parts. Thank you. Last word, hackathon. There is a hackathon being organized by, um, uh, by Renaissance Numérique. Please tell them where it is now. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's all of you which are interested in, in going on with that conversation, you are cordially invited to participate to our hackathon that started this afternoon. If you, have, if you are interested in, just come and visit Ma uh, Mike. Can you, can you get up? You can go and, and ask Mike to, allow, to have all the information. The idea is to go on with finding solutions. Thank you all. Yes, good afternoon. May I ask those who are not attending the IGFSA General Assembly to leave the room as quickly and quietly as possible. We have already eaten into our session. And and we will start the IGFSA General Assembly in a minute or two. <clears throat>